uh, here we go. Uh, the technology worked. Um, closing out the session today, I'm really excited to hear from Oren Robertson. And Oren is a postdoctoral associate at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and among other things, he's been incredibly generous with his time uh, in agreeing to participate remotely today from Ithaca. And as Scott sort of alluded to earlier, and Oren, it was Scott Hall from NIFWIF who mentioned your work, um, but as Scott alluded to earlier, I think the work that Oren's going to share with us today may very well change how we all think about monitoring the outcomes of our conservation efforts. It's really just that important. So Oren, I'm going to turn it over to you. You've got uh, until 2.40, and um, thanks very much. All right, well, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk uh, briefly, as I can, about uh, you know, which is what eBird is, what some of the newest products are, and then give you some examples of uh, how we're using eBird for conservation, because we, we often don't do a great job of, uh, of showing people that. Uh, so what, what we're looking at here is, uh, is not a map of the world. This is uh, every eBird checklist through 2016 plotted against a black background. Um, this represents over 30 million hours of collecting bird observations. Uh, that's about 3,400 years. Uh, so eBird is a huge biodiversity database. And like I said, this map's about two years old. Uh, so there's much more data in there. You would see Mexico and Central America a lot brighter. Uh, India would be a lot brighter on this map if, if we made it with the data today. Uh, so eBird is, is one of the largest biodiversity databases in existence, but when you work with citizen science data, there are, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, when you work with any data, there are challenges, but th those things get really magnified when you start working with, with citizen science data. So there are essentially two processes, two, two grand processes that create this data, so to speak. Uh, the ecological process, right? That's the environmental factors like habitat. If an e-birder goes to a specific habitat, there are certain birds you would expect to see there. Uh, spatial and temporal factors, when we think about migratory birds. Migratory species are uh, at different, in different places at different times of the year, uh, and often in different concentrations. And then you have things that, that are part of the observation process, right? Some species are very hard to detect. Uh, some folks want to go birding for a longer period of time or over longer distances than others, right? Some observers are more skilled than others. Uh, most people want to go birding where it's convenient, right? Close to roads, close to home, places where they know they're going to go see a lot of birds. And all of this stuff creates a uh, spatial bias in our sample. So these things have to be accounted for. These and several other things have to be accounted for before we can start putting them in models. Uh, and this is just a, a simple uh, example of, of, of how we would model relative abundance, given these ecological processes, the observational processes. And before we even get to this point, uh, all of this data has gone through uh, some expert filters to make sure the data that's coming in even makes sense on the surface before we even get this far. Um, so you see year in, in, in these equations. So when we have relative abundance across years, of course that's a trend, right? So we can get trends for many species by doing what I, what I just described, right? Determining the relative abundance across years. And what we're looking at here is a trend map for wood thrush, uh, the circles represent 25 by 25 kilometer areas, and they're scaled to the maximum relative abundance over the last years. What that means is that the larger circles are areas where a lot of birds are or were. Uh, smaller circles means fewer birds, right? Red is a decline, and blue is growth. Uh, so a, a large red circle, which is unfortunately what we see a lot of here, would mean that there were a lot of birds relative to the population in an area and that those have declined. Whereas a, 
a large blue circle would mean the opposite, that there are a lot of birds relative to the rest of the population there now, probably because of some increase over the last 10 years or so, which is, uh, I think these go back to 2006. Uh, so over the last 10 or 12 years is what, what we're looking at here. Um, so this is all new and exciting stuff. There's tons of data in eBird. Uh, we can produce some really cool products like this. But what I really want to show you is how we use this stuff to benefit on the ground conservation. Uh, and I'll uh, going to go over a few projects. Uh, one on tricolor blackbirds, one on bald and golden eagles, and uh, another on shorebirds, but for whatever reason, my shorebird's not showing up on the picture. So, tricolor blackbirds are almost entirely restricted to California. Uh, they've experienced a very rapid decline over the last 100 years, and even in the last 10 to 12 years, they've experienced uh, a pretty huge decline. They were petitioned to be listed in California uh, and, and federally, in 2015, and one of the biggest criticisms of this petition was a lack of population model that could demonstrate a decline. These are colonial nesting species, and they have very low site fidelity. The most recent studies suggest that it's uh, more than half of breeding colonies do not go back to the same place the next year, regardless of, of how successful they are. So, you could go count you know, a colony of 8,000 of these things one year and then go to the same place, count none the next year, and that not be indicative of a decline. It may just mean that the colony's breeding somewhere where you're not surveying. So that makes these things very hard to count. Uh, we did have some partners who had been collecting data on these birds over the last several years. Uh, we had a lot of banding data, thanks to the, the effort of uh, this person here, Bob Meese. Um, we had a, a, some nesting data over the same time frame, and somebody like me sees banding data, nesting data, I think we can get count data, I immediately go to integrated population model. Um, but given the issues with the count data, we, we really didn't know where that was going to come from. Um, BBS was one thing we looked at, but you know what BBS tells us is, is what we already know about them. Uh, that they are colonial nesters, and that they have very low site fidelity, right? If a, if a colony settled near a BBS route one year, we see a spike. If a colony didn't settle near a BBS, year, or a BBS route, we, we don't see that spike, right? So, so BBS was not going to be uh, super useful for this study. There, uh, there's a tricolor blackbird-specific study done in California uh, every three years. Um, but that uh, three-year time step was a little much for, for an IPM, given that we had yearly data for the other, the other pieces. And also, this, this survey may suffer from the, uh, the issues due to site fidelity, right? They, they go to fixed sites to count them all the time, but you don't really know if you're, you're, you're doing a good job there because you can't tell if it's a decline or if they've just moved. So we used eBird as the count data in the IPM. And I can, I can get as detailed into the modeling pieces of this as, as you want later. Uh, I've left it out for now, but uh, that's, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so I will get to some of the results here. There has likely been a decline in tricolor blackbird populations. Uh, the average decline was about 34% uh, according to our model. And about 94% of the model runs resulted in a declining population. Um, sorry. Sorry about that. So we can then start asking some ecological and uh, conservation relevant questions from this. Uh, like what is the population process that's driving this decline, right? Since we 
analyzed all this data together and essentially allowed it to converse uh, and interact within our model, we can ask these questions about how these different data sets uh, or, or the, the processes that they represent uh, affect the overall population. And what we saw was that female adult survival and fecundity are both highly and positively correlated with growth rate, but female adult survival is already very high. Uh, so what this means from a, an ecological standpoint is that these are the two things that are driving population, the population trajectory of the species. But from a conservation perspective, we know that female adult survival is high, so we probably can't move it with any conservation action. Fecundity was pretty low. Um, so the best bang for your buck, so to speak, with uh, conservation intervention would be to aim that conservation at things that would protect nests or nest sites or anything that may boost the country. Uh, so this work uh, helped lead to the species being listed in California. And this is just, just one example of how we were able to integrate multiple data sources collected by our partners with eBird and uh, answer some of their, their conservation-relevant questions that they have. Um, I'm going to move to another example that uses some of these new eBird data products. So I'm probably going to gloss over way too much detail, but as uh, this is a project with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and just briefly, they, they want to be able to define these low-risk areas for eagle take permitting. So the idea is to kind of streamline the permitting process for wind farms or uh, other projects so that the proposed projects in the low risk areas could be permitted without having to go through this rigorous two year environmental impact uh, with, with regard to Eagle's uh, process. The problem was that their data was very coarse their abundance data was really coarse and they needed a much finer scale analysis than they were able to do with what they had. So we were able to put together some, uh, some of these products for them. As I showed you earlier, the wood thrush is, uh, the, the wood thrush map was at 25 by 25 kilometers. And that's part of the just basic production run of stuff. So, for a lot of species and a lot of regions, we can get much smaller than 25 by 25 kilometers. Here, for uh, bald and golden eagles, we can get down to 8 by 8 kilometers. Uh, and this, what we're looking at here, is relative abundance. Um, but we can all, and this is year round. We can also just pull out winter or breeding season or one of the migration seasons. And the seasons here are defined by species experts. They're not just arbitrary breeding or winter seasons. They're <coughs> experts have said, this is the date breeding starts for bald eagles, and that's when our breeding season data starts. Right? And of course, we, we did the same with golden eagles. Uh, another product we were able to give them were these use day maps. So these maps show the proportion of a season. Uh, here it's year round, it's not a specific season, but it's the proportion of a season that at least one individual of a species is detected in one of those eight by eight pixels. And here's the, the, the one, the same, same data for, uh, for golden eagles. And working with them, we didn't just give them these maps or uh, you know, do these analyses for them. We were going to talk to them and, and walk them through what we had available, what we could do, uh, how we modeled them, and then gave them this underlying data, right? Because they know the questions that they want answered uh, a lot better than we do. And uh, they have very capable quantitative and GIS folks there. So we were able to just give them the data here and uh, let them do whatever they needed to do with it in order to best answer their questions. And, and you know, we were here for uh, support if they had issues with our data. So this is kind of, uh, you know, in contrast to what we did with Tricolor Blackbird, where we got all the data and did the model and all of that stuff uh, here. 
uh, where whereas this, this Eagle project, we were able to give them all the data to help them better answer their own question. Um, the, uh, the last project I'll talk about is, uh, is a project with the Nature Conservancy in the Central Valley of California, where uh, they have been, you know, essentially using a reverse auction to, you know, kind of, for lack of a better word, rent farmland uh, during shorebird migration. And they've been doing point counts at a lot of these sites and uh, a lot of the control sites, but now we can add eBird data to what they've collected. So we can do a few things with that. We can integrate the two data sets together and analyze them together. Uh, we can use the distribution we, ca uh, we calculate from the eBird data as a variable in their own models with their own data. This has been, uh, been shown to improve accuracy. There was a recent paper a year or two ago with, uh, where someone did this with brown-headed nuthatch to show how much uh, improvement in accuracy you get when uh, integrating the two data sets. And we can also take the eBird data and look at a, a, a wider piece of the surrounding areas and uh, determine if there's been some population level response to what they've been doing. You know, we can answer a question like, are we actually increasing the number of birds or are we just moving them around by, by managing in this way? Um, we can evaluate whether or not they should continue to monitor certain sites. You know, maybe eBird has some of these sites covered and the time and money that they spent surveying them could, uh, could be spent somewhere else. So we're, we're starting to use eBird to help answer all of these kinds of questions too. Um, the, uh, the last thing I want to touch on is that eBird can be used as a portal for any specific project and in many states, uh, agencies and even countries are already doing this. Um, it can be set up to, to your project specifications. It's, uh, you know, everybody will have access to it. Um, you know, this, there's the, the smartphone interface. Everybody's got their smartphones on them now. So out in the field, you know, you can just put the, your observations in uh, for your specific protocol uh, right there in the field. Uh, and it can be set up as large as something like the Wisconsin Breeding Bird Atlas, uh, or as small as, as a weekend winter survey for tricolor blackbirds. Um, so that's, that's another thing I wanted to, to kind of touch on that, uh, that a lot of folks didn't, didn't know about eBird. And with that, uh, I would like to, to point out some of the, the folks who worked uh, just as hard, if not harder, as I did on, on a lot of these projects. And uh, if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to uh, try to answer it. Thanks, Oren. That's great. Um, yeah, and we do. We have a couple minutes for questions. So if anyone has a question, shout it out. So, well, I, I'll, uh, I'll lead. Um, what's the... A lot of the a lot of the conservation actions that, that you the examples here of evaluating sort of different conservation actions or evaluating risk factors are at um, at fairly large scales. What would you sort of speculate is the range of spatial scales that are reasonably sort of evaluated using using eBird. Obviously, on the, on the upside, it's probably quite large. Um, how, how finely can these, these data be resolved, do you think? So, I always hate to answer questions this way, but it depends, right? It, <laughs> so, if, if uh, you were in, a, in an area, like, like I showed a couple of projects in California, there's a lot of data in California. So, we can get very fine scale analyses. I think with one of our triclip blackbird studies, we were at uh, 500 meter resolution, you know, which is which is pretty small. Um, if there's uh, the the shorebird project in California, there is so much data in that area that we can just use stationary counts, which are essentially point counts in eBird, and then we can get really fine with it. I think we're at about two or three hundred meter resolution with those. Um, but if you're in an area with, with sparse data, 
or if you have a, uh, a species that's very hard to detect, um, of course, where you're going to have to, to be at a much coarser scale. Um, but, but like I said, with, with it, it, it's a species-specific and region-specific uh, issue, but in, in some cases we can get very fine scale. Yeah, no, that's great. That really illustrates the power to recognizing that, that there are caveats there. Any last question? We, we're sort of running out of time, but if there's anybody with one quick question, we can take that. If not, um, another round of applause for Orin for taking the time. And Orin, if you want to hang on one sec, I'll chat with you in a minute. But let me okay. just um, thank everybody for being part of the session today. Uh, many thanks to our speakers. Um, I've come away enlightened. Uh, and we'll come back um, in a little bit for 